Psalms chapter 11. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. In the Lord I put my trust. And that's the only one we're to put our trust into. Some put their trust in other men. Some put their trust in money. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountains? Well, there was a time when Jesus was on this planet that they came up to him and said, Don't you know that uh, Herod's going to get you? And he said, You know, go tell that fox. And what he's saying, Listen, you know, if you were putting your trust in the Lord and someone comes along and says, You know what? Your enemy's coming. Flee. Well, that's contra what you're saying you believe. I'm not going to run if I believe in God unless God tells me to go. And there's a point in the Bible where, where Jesus told his disciples, Listen, you get this one point, flee to another city. Well, that's only after, you know, complete rejection. So that's almost like a proverb there. I'm going to trust in the Lord, but someone's going to tell me to flee. For lo, this is, this is why we, you know, flee like a bird. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. Uh-oh. That's one of the horsemen over there in Revelation chapter 5. The wicked. We saw that last night. In David's life, the wicked are those like King Saul. But in prophecy, it's the Antichrist. There are three applications for all scripture. I can spiritualize this and use it for a message for the church. As long as I don't break the Bible and, and make the Bible say something it don't say, I can spiritualize anything. As long as I don't do the Bible wrong. Historical. Historical, well, it, it's David and his, on his run away from King Saul or any of his other enemies. And then doctrinal, and here is, is, is a prophet, prophecy, of the Antichrist. They make ready their arrow upon the string. Well, that's one thing that the, that the rider and the horse in Revelation, he doesn't have arrow. He just has a bow because he comes in with a piece. Well, here are arrows. And you would think if somebody's got an arrow and a bow, that, you know, yeah, you're going to want to run. And put your trust in the Lord. The Bible says that Satan has fiery darts upon the string. Well, that's where the arrows go. That they may privately, privately, shoot at the upright in heart. Privately is without being known. You don't see them. A sniper, we would call it today. And what is their target? The upright in heart. The wicked men are against those that do right. David had enemies of people because he did right. Jesus Christ had all kinds of enemies because he did right. Paul had enemies because he did right. And they'll do things and try things just because you're upright. They're trying to get you back down to their level. And it's a sorry thing today in the Christian church that Christians are doing it because they don't want to pick themselves up. They'd rather bring you down. If the foundations be destroyed, the foundation is Jesus Christ for us. The foundation is the Lord God that I'll put my trust. If you can destroy that foundation, what can the righteous do? No one's going to kill God. No one is going to get rid of God. So guess what? Only thing the righteous can do is keep dependent on God. And if you decide to leave against God, if you decide to walk your own way, turn your way from God, God is no less God. You're the one that lost the faith. Your foundation is sure in Jesus Christ and in God the Father, the Holy Spirit. The Lord... All right, here's a foundation. The Lord is in his holy temple. 
The Lord's throne is in heaven. There's your foundation. You know, world history has been, especially in South America and, and a lot of the Latino countries and a lot of places where the Roman Catholics are, or the Roman Catholic Church, is they get one guy that surfs authority over another guy, and then another guerrilla group comes in and takes over that. I mean, that's just, you know, you don't know who's going to rule what according to what day down south in South America and Latin America and all that. But you're never going to have God overthrown on his throne. And even Revelation 12 says that Satan is going to try to do it in the last intergalactical inter battle. As Michael and his angels fight against Satan and his angels. God's throne is not going to be moved or overthrown. No one will sit on God's throne but God. For all eternity. Eternity past. Today in time and eternity future. And the thing is, even Jesus Christ is not sitting on God's throne. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Yeah, I know Jesus is God and God is Jesus, but there's still a thing with the Trinity that God is higher than Jesus. God's throne is in heaven. Well, how do you get to heaven? NASA launching spacecraft, China launching, you know, we ain't going to do it. You can, they say you can't get to the nearest star. So man ain't going to do it. Man ain't going to overthrow God. We see in, in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 that Satan can go up to God. Well, he ain't going to overthrow him. Satan has to do what God tells him to do. God says yes, Satan can do it. If God says no, Satan can't do it. His eyes, God's eyes, behold. The eyes of the Lord in every place, behold the good and the evil. Or evil and the good, excuse me. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tries the righteous. Why? Why would he do that? To show you how much you walk and how, how much you need more walk. The things that happen in your life where you fail, don't take it as a failure. Take it as, oh, that's somewhere in my life that I need to work on and need to pray more. That's something that God is showing you. Listen, you're not perfect. Let me show you. Oh, okay. And that's something you need to pray about. That's something that you may have to work and tweak and get the tools out. That's why God tries us. And every trial we get is to make us finer and better. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his God so hated. So you can't say troubles and tribute. You, you can't say that God chastises the wicked, the unsaved. Because according to John chapter 8, 44, they are under the father of Satan. You are under the child of, you are under God as, as father. If you're born again and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. Now, it is a no thing. You don't go around slapping other kids that don't belong to you. Now, I know early in the public school system, they would swap children, but they were given authority. But pretty much, it, you don't go around beating other kids that are not yours. God is not going to chastise an unsaved person. You cannot say to an unsaved person, Oh, God's chastised. No. Because then Satan would have the right to step up and say, What are you doing to my child? It's not yours. Now, God may th throw things in his life to wake him up. He might show things that, Hey, listen, judgment's coming. But that's not an act of chastisement. That's an act of warning before he does judge. God always gives a warning before judgment. And it's not chastisement. 
Now, if you're a child of God and st things happen in your life, it may be that God's got the rod out because you've been a bad boy, bad son. And God will chastise you because the Bible says in Hebrew, so you don't think I'm cussing, you, you'd be like bastards. And God loves you enough to chastise you. Satan don't love you to chastise you. Satan will just let you keep on going the way you're going. And he'll only intermeddle in your life when a Christian comes into your life. Then he'll step in. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world who has blinded them, their hearts or their minds, at least they see the glorious light of the gospel. I'm not quoting that verse correctly. But do you realize for an unsaved person, that's the only time Satan will care about them? When, when someone wants to bring them the gospel? Then he'll step in, take away that seed so you can go to hell. God hates the wicked, and then that love is violence. You gotta get that God lo loves and God hates. God is not just a God of love, He also hates things. Upon the wicked, He, God, shall rain snares, traps, fire, and brimstone. Well, he did that in Sodom and Gomorrah, literally. A horrible tempest, a storm, troubles. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now, a cup in the Bible is judgment. And what a cup is in the Bible is God will give a nation or a group of people or a religious person, organization like the Roman Catholic Church. And I would believe he starts that cup empty. And as you keep sinning, as you keep doing wickedness, as you go about to defy God, what he tells you, that cup gets full and fuller until one day it is the fullest and then when that cup is filled then the wrath of God comes see people say when Jesus was in the garden he didn't want to die that was his prayer that was not his prayer read it he says, Father, that this cup may pass from me. That is not, death is not a cup. A cup is filled with sin. What Jesus Christ prayed was when he finally realized what he was going to drink, all the sins of the world, all the wrath of God upon sin, that was, he, he didn't want the cup. He didn't mind the death. What was the cup? Can I say it? And not be called a hypocrite? Where do you where do you pay for sins if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in your sin? You burn in hell. The point that Jesus Christ became sin. All of sin and going down into hell and depositing all those sins. You know, it would have been good for Jesus to die and get buried and fairy tale himself over to the the thief who died on the cross and not cross hell. How could he pay for your sins that, that for a person that goes to hell if he didn't go to hell? That's the cup. And when you're talking about these nations of the cup, is there's so much sin. There, listen, Judah got in so much sin. When that cup started overflowing, that was the third time Nebuchadnezzar came in the land. Nebuchadnezzar came in the land three times. And Judah's cup overfilled the third time. 
and go back and read Second Chronicles and read uh, read the Second Kings and all that and Daniel and uh, Isaiah and all the sins, burning cakes to the Queen of Heaven, worshiping in all the, all the, the mountains, closing the house of God up. Those every time they took that they, that cup filled up, and then one day you got a drink. And as a Christian, we all have cups. We are a vessel of God, but we have cups. And you keep on defying God and what the Word of God says. And you keep drinking yourself. You keep smoking. You keep caring about what your sins. And you just throw that cup up. And one day, once that cup starts overflowing, then God will provide judgment upon you. You say, well, why is this happening? Why is God ju judging? Because you filled your cup. Now there's a cup of the Holy Spirit where, where there's a hand that filled my cup, Lord. Now that's talking about the Holy Spirit. Cups is a particular item to be uh, studied in the Bible. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Oh, there's something that God loves. God is love. And when you find somebody that quotes that, what is righteous in their life? Well, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come to the shore of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. Paul said today in the, in the Bible, in, in uh Romans chapter 7, that which I want to do, I don't, and that which I do want to do, I don't. He says, I'm a perverse man, this flesh. You want God to love you, you got to be righteous. And you can't be wicked. And you can't have one part of your life unrighteous and and seven-eighths of your life righteous. Listen, if you were to bake a cake, a birthday cake, and everything what, you, what the person wants, and the color frosting, and the cake decorations, and all the proper candles, and it's perfect, and it's there at the table, and, and you know, and you blow the candles out, and they start cutting to it. And they take a slice here and they, and they give it to the person. And they take another slice here. And as they're doing a slice, and then they find bugs. They find a bug in it. What are you going to be prone to do? They had 11 slices of cake that was good and one had a bug in it. And Solomon writes in the book of Eagle Odysseys, you know, dead flies make their pocket very stink. You could have seven things good in your life and that eighth one make it, make it a stink before God. And there's only one way to clean that stink. That stink is to put it under the blood. And work on it. And try to get rid of it. And try to do right. You know, David. You know, David's stink was women. He had trouble with women. He got himself a, a good wife, Abigail. I believe. Between, I believe the marriage between him and Micah w was done. I believe that he deserted her. The next wife he gets is Abigail. She's a wonderful woman. She's a godly woman. She she has much wisdom. And soon as no longer he takes her as a marriage, that same verse, if not the next verse, and then he goes and marries this woman. Then he goes and marries this woman. And he ain't happy with that. Listen, he's got all the beautiful women. He's got all that. And he, he, he takes a look at a woman who's not his wife. That was David's. David needed to pray over a little thing called lust.
That's the thing. That one little thing in our life will get us, and it got David. Oh, Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bears. 